Tibet is a mysterious land that has intrigued the West for many years. New Age philosophers and practitioners have taken advantage of its ambiguous history, claiming to have contact with ascended masters from that area. Modern Tibet is west of China with a huge expanse of various ethnic groups. It is mostly an autonomous region, however, some of the areas closer to China are controlled and suppressed. Starting in the 50s, China's government began to intrude on Tibet and attempted to control the area. Tibetan Buddhist monks resisted fiercely and still are to this day. Tibet is home to a unique and large population of Buddhists. Their leader, the Dalai Lama, was forced to exile the Holy Land in 1959 to avoid political persecution or assassination from China. He still influences his people from Dharamsala in India. Tibetan Buddhism was banned by China and many monasteries were destroyed. Among the protests that the Tibetan Buddhists were performing, they also took to an extreme form of protest known as self-immolation. In this practice, they meditate and set themselves on fire, a highly spiritual practice in their form of Buddhism, which elevates their soul towards the higher levels of karma. They see this self-burning as an offer and sacrifice to their people's struggle and to the Creator so that a righteous response may be heard and answered. The ban on Tibetan Buddhism was lifted in 1979 and the Dalai Lama received a Nobel Peace Prize in 1989 recognizing his non-violent protests against Chinese suppression. However, political suppression still occurs and from time to time the protests are necessary. Tibet first appeared on Arabic maps. It is speculated to either be rooted from the Tibetan term for Upper Tibet, Stedbed, or from the early Indian name for Tibet, Bet. The Chinese word for Tibetans is Betia. Tibetans have various names for themselves, all relating to their geographical area. Tibet has differing mythologies about its birth. According to one legend, a monkey meditating in a cave was seduced by a female demon. Her and the monkey produced six children who grew up to form the six major tribes of Tibet. Another myth recounts how the first Tibetan king came down to earth from heaven on a rope or ladder. These myths are believed to have come from the ancient Bon religion. From an outside look, Tibet seems to be uniform in its Buddhist beliefs. However, within Tibet, there are also domestic tensions. Prior to Buddhism becoming the national religion, there was a belief system much older than Tibetan Buddhism that was practiced widely by the people. This religion is known as the Bon religion. It still exists, but is mostly at contention with Tibetan Buddhism. The Bon priest known as Bonpos, are viewed as sorcerers because of their practices in interacting with spirits and demons, a lot of time performing seances and exorcisms. The original religion relied heavily on shaman magical practices and mantras. Its main focus was preparing the soul for the afterlife, ensuring a safe journey. Chinese reports from the Tang Dynasty state that the ancient Tibetans would sacrifice animals and sometimes humans to the gods of heaven and earth. The Shen, or priest, would sometimes burn juniper twigs and berries as a narcotic amidst their rituals to contact or banish spirits of the deceased. It is common for them to willfully summon spirits to possess them so they can communicate through a seance and ask them questions. Its modern practices are similar to Buddhism and its practitioners are hard to distinguish from the Buddhists for they wear similar garments, occupy the same sacred places, practice similar rituals, and even have word for word similar religious texts. Scholars used to think the Bon text plagiarized Buddhist texts, but it is now known that in some cases it was actually the other way around. 
It's also generally accepted that both religions relied on an earlier source for their spiritual beliefs, giving them the similarities that they have. David L. Snellgrove's 1967 A Cultural History of Tibet and Nine Ways of Bon were the first among Western literature to translate and give insight on Tibet and its ancient pre-Buddhist myths. Bon has a number of unique gods, unique practices, and its own sacred text, Nine Ways of Bon. Its great tension with the onset of Buddhist colonization, we are told, began in the 8th and 9th centuries CE. Struggles took place between the ruling house of Tibet, some siding with Buddhism and others who remained loyal to the native Bon. Bon sages were expelled in the 8th century by King Trisong Detsen. He was a fierce leader, pushing his empire's borders, even entering into some of China at the time. As a result, Tibet controlled parts of the famed Silk Road, the mainstream trading route, for about two centuries. The Bon religion belonged to a legendary empire that could have easily overpowered the Tibetan Buddhism. This empire was known as Shang Tsung. Shangshung was an ancient culture and kingdom of western and northwestern Tibet. Shangshung people are mentioned frequently in ancient Tibetan texts as the original rulers of central and western Tibet. Only in the last few decades have archaeologists been given access to do archaeological work in the areas once occupied by this legendary empire. Shangshung means land of the rock. Rock referring to a huge mythical bird akin to the Buddhist Garuda. Tibetan Buddhist master, professor of Tibetan and Mongolian language and literature at Naples Eastern University, Namkai Norbu, who lived to be 80 years old from 1938 to 2018, also spoke on the legends of the Shangshung people. By the 1st century BC, a neighboring kingdom arose in the Yarlung Valley, and the Yarlung king, Drigum Tsenpo, tried to eradicate the Bon priest from the area. This poor attempt led to his assassination, and the great empire that was Shangshung carried on. The capital city of Shangshung was called Kyunglung, the Silver Palace of Garuda, southwest of Mount Kailash. Mount Kailash was the holiest of mountains for the Bon people of Shangshung. Mount Kailash is a sacred place that is held important for other spiritual peoples as well. Hindus make a pilgrimage to the site of its astounding snow-capped scenery at the base where a holy lake lay as well. They revere the place to be the throne of Shiva. It represents the earthly reflection of the center of the universe. The lake feeds the four rivers that give life to the area, the Indus, Brahmaputra, Sutlej, and Karnali. You know, I wrote a book called The Maharishi of Kailash. This is a wonderful saint who is supposedly 400 years old. And he is still alive in this mountain in Tibet called Kailash up to the age 105 he served the lord for 75 years traveling around the whole world and he decided to spend the rest of the remaining time that he has on this earth giving himself to fasting and praying and meditation so among all his travels he had found this mountain to be a beautiful excluded spot from all the maddening crowd so he found a nice little cave in the mountain and he began to just live there as a recluse. He saw the Lord Jesus Christ coming down in a cloud. And the Lord appeared to him and said, Well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been so faithful to serve me. Now, today, I grant you eternal life. You will be alive till I come again and your job 
is to pray for the church. One thing is clear, here, this we are hundred percent sure is there's a tremendous amount of activity in the lake and this activity is… the nature of the activity is such that it has nothing to do with anything that we know as life on this planet. It's… India is a place where they preserve their graves forever. Yogis who died thousands of years ago, still their samadhis are maintained and kept. Why wouldn't they keep Shiva's samadhi? This is all conjecture. This, there is no fact to support this. This is just crazy. This doesn't stand to any reason. Why for millions of years, one particular spot on the planet has been used by life which doesn't belong here? Why? And why the same place? And why for so long? It is beloved by nearby Buddhists and of course is believed by the Bon to be the site where their mythical leader, Tonpa Shenrap, descended from heaven. The Bonpos claim that Tonpa Shenrap or the teacher Shenrap is the true enlightened one opposed to Buddha. According to Rolf Alfred Stein, author of the 1962 Tibetan Civilization, the area of Shangshung was foreign to Tibet, writing that, then further west, the Tibetans encountered a distinctly foreign nation, Shangshung, with its capital at Kyunglung near Mount Kailash, whose language has come down to us through early documents. Though still unidentified, it seems to be Indo-European. Geographically, the country was certainly open to India, both through Nepal and by way of Kashmir and Ladakh. Kailash is a holy place for the Indians, who make pilgrimages to it. No one knows how long they have done so, but the cult may well go back to the times when Shangshung was still independent of Tibet. How far Shangshung stretched to the north, east, and west is a mystery. Stein claims that there were significant similarities with the bond of Shangshung and Hinduism, stating that, in fact, about 950, the Hindu king of Kabul had a statue of Vishnu, which he claimed had been given to him by the king of Betta, who in turn had obtained it from Kailash. Just as the Hindus had the Svastika and the Buddhists had the Manji, so too did the Bon venerate the symbol of the swastika, known to them as the Jung Drung. The Jung Drung, like the other cultural forms, can be represented as pointing left or right, the left usually representing the chaos of nature that we must balance with, and the right pointing Jung Drung as bringing balanced good fortune. Not much of the Shangshung language or text is left behind. Danish scholar Eric Haar claimed to have published a lexicon of Tibetan and Shangshung words in 1986. According to their text, the entire kingdom of Tibet was born. Occasionally, they would endure enemies to the religion and the kingdom. Drigum Senpo, one of Tibet's earliest kings, persecuted the religion, burning many texts. Because of this, a priesthood was formed which hid away texts being safeguarded by a secret society titled the Turton, Treasure Revealers. It was the later 8th century ruler, Trisong Detson, who forced the kingdom into Buddhism, pressuring Bon underground. Bon legends state that the final overthrow of the Shangshung occurred at the hands of Detsen. He conspired with the youngest queen of Shangshung's king, King Ligmia. Detsen offered her royalty and rulership if she helped kill her husband. Unfortunately, she was seduced and agreed. The king Ligmia was ambushed and killed bringing an end to the stable empire. One of his elder wives, however, was devastated and sought out Sheng Shung's most powerful sorcerer at the time, Girpong Drempa Namka, teacher of Bon, Sky Recollection. 
It was said that this sorcerer was about 1200 years old. He was a powerful Shen, or priest. Drenpa Namka agreed to help the widow. He cursed the king to become fatally ill. However, the king sought out Namka and bargained with him for his life. The curse was lifted on the condition that the people of Bonn were allowed their autonomy in the new kingdom. To this day, there are tensions but tolerance between the Buddhist and Bonn. The Buddhists see King Detsen as a hero, whereas the Bonn see him as a coward. 1842 Bonpo scholar and abbot of the Menri Monastery, Niyama Tenzin, described the enforcing of Buddhism into the country as the perverse prayer of a demon. As the Tibetan kingdom grew, Shengshun was overran by new tribes as it lost its central hold, fading into a kingdom separated by new peoples. Its kingdom became a mystery and to this day is hard to uncover by historians. There is a tale about its hidden text incidentally coming to light during the 10th century when wanderers were scourging ancient monasteries for gold. They came across boxes of old Bond text. These discoveries were preceded by supernatural signs from spiritual beings delivering visions to natives about the whereabouts of this treasure. The now survived texts are collected in the Bonpo Kanjur, officially assembled in 1450. They contain many similarities to Buddhist texts, but instead of claiming their roots to India, like Tibetan Buddhism, the texts claim their roots to be in Shangshung. It also contains unique philosophical texts in a section titled the Tanjur, which includes secret meditational practices. The Bonpos believe in a multitude of good and evil beings, some who are ascended masters who have transcended life and death, which aid humanity to enlightenment, and some evil beings who have not ascended, who are trapped here, attempting to keep humans stuck in this realm of existence. Among these are the Klu, water spirits of the underworld who could take the form of snakes at will, similar to the Indian Nagas. They also guard secrets and treasures. The Sri are vampire-like creatures that eat children. There is also mention of a strange god named Yar La Shampo, a white man who sometimes transforms into a yak bull residing in the Himalayan mountains. It is said he once impregnated a widowed queen during her sleep in a vision. Bonpos believe that the Eternal Bon is a legendary city west of Shangshung that can only be visited now by visions or supernatural means after being supernaturally purified. This Eternal Bon or city is also called Tazik. It is said their legendary founder, Tonpa Shenrap, was the king of this city. Tonpa came here from the etherical Tazik with six emissaries teaching the Bon way, then leaving, ascending back into the heavens from Mount Kailash. The city of Tazik or Tajik was a precursor for the legend of Shambhala. Shambhala has been spoken of within New Age circles as being a mysterious paradise hidden within the Himalayan mountains of the now defunct land of the once Shangshung Empire. The legend of Shambhala was introduced to the West by 19th century Tibetologist Alexander Kosma de Koros. There is a fascination for Tibetan Buddhism in Hungary because of the amazing work Kosma de Koros (1784–1842) achieved in this field of study. He is honored as the founder of Tibetology in Europe. He compiled the first English and Tibetan dictionaries. He is remembered as an eccentric and hopeful explorer who had somewhat of a naive intuition. He believed he would find the origin of his Hungarian people in Tibet. Among his journeys, he came across the accounts of Shambhala and brought them back to the modern Western world. His writings were enjoyed by the famous Russian mystic Helena Petrovna Blavatsky. Of Dekoros, she stated, a poor Hungarian, Kosma Dekoros, not only without means, but a veritable beggar, set out on foot for Tibet through unknown and dangerous countries. 
urged only by the love of learning and the eager wish to shed light on the historical origin of his nation the result was that inexhaustible mines of literary treasures were discovered blavatsky claimed to have been initiated by a secret group of mystics in tibet known as the mahatmas or ascended masters one in particular known as moria she was among the first to bring this exciting phenomenon to the west and soon after more claims were being made about contacts with spiritual masters from the east and tibet in the late nineteenth century british theosophist a p sinet and a o hume were the first to shockingly receive correspondences from these supposed ascended leaders these back-and-forth messages and teachings culminated in what are now known as the mahatma letters the original letters are secured in the british library in london as unprecedented historical items blavatsky famous for her incalculable book isis unveiled claimed that she received wisdom from a secret society hidden in shambhala known as the great white brotherhood and that it was these masters that were secretly guiding humanity towards a higher consciousness the westernized fascination with tibet and shambhala was also popularized by annie besant a successor to blavatsky and a major pioneer of new age philosophy she like blavatsky believed the mythical kingdom resided somewhere in the gobi desert which could have been a luscious landscape in some ancient time lost Bassant claimed to have astral projected on several occasions to meet with the spiritual teachers of Shambhala, meeting their leader, whom she titled the King of the World. Alice Bailey, following Bassant as a leader in theosophy and later a pioneer of her own organization, also taught about Shambhala but differed on various points. Bailey believed the beings of Shambhala originated from the planet Venus millions of years ago she wrote that when she was a young girl she was visited by a spiritual emissary who she dubbed the tibetan and it would be this master who would later telepathically dictate many of her later writings for the lucius trust publishing house russian mystic nicholas rorick also further popularized the idea of shambhala by writing on the subject in the nineteen twenties rorick and his wife were influenced by blavatsky to explore tibet for the lost kingdom of shambhala blavatsky convinced them that she had received a message from her spiritual masters stating that the roricks should endeavor to find the lost city during that time the nineteen twenties all world powers were seeking to control central asia attempting to gain access and control to its untouched and mystical areas rorick's mission was backed by the american government however some speculate that rorick had covert ties with russia's secret service to report any actual findings of shambhala and what might have been found there gleb boki a leader of the cheka the ussr secret police was fascinated by the shambhala myth and was interested to know if any actual weapons or mystical powers could be found there to be used to control the world rorick and his wife were not very political and being that the trek through the perilous uncharted land needed much financial support it's been speculated that they agreed to a deal with russia for financial help and in return would report anything of interest it was hard to get into tibet at that time but the roricks were able to convince the local leaders to allow them through the towns and monasteries and onward to the hidden mountains rorick himself already a famed archaeologist and painter documented his travels in diaries and paintings The Russian government eventually pulled out of their support. For almost a year, the Roricks and their team went missing. In his Shambhala the Resplendent, he recounts that they were held in a Tibetan military encampment where five of the members died. Shortly after this, the trek ended and they returned home. Rorik mentioned that the closest they ever got to Shambhala was in the Altai Mountains, where an old believer, as he called him, showed them a blocked entranceway to a lost city within the earth. 
The wanderer told them that the entranceway would remain blocked until humanity was ready. Later English writer James Hilton would also further popularize the legend with an adventurous novel titled Lost Horizon, where Shambhala was turned into the famed Shangri-La, another influential piece of literature that caused great interest into Tibet was German writer Theodore Ilion's Darkness Over Tibet. Ilion's novel is assumed to be a real account of his journey through the deserts of Tibet in search for spiritual wisdom. Upon his fantastic journey, he finally comes across an opportunity to meet with a rich and powerful monk who is a part of a secret society. After having intellectual conversation and debate, the monk is impressed with Ilion's knowledge on spiritual matters, so he invites Ilion to the secret society's headquarters. Ilion is concerned when he finds that the headquarters reside in an underground city in the desert comprised with a network of emotionless monks living in a dark occult environment. The people that led him there profess to be leaders of the light, using their powers to help the world. Ilion sensed that something was off about the city and its people who seemed to be in a trance-like state. After meeting with their leader, the Prince of Light, he quickly realizes that they are not benevolent monks, but dark yogis practicing black magic, masquerading as good monks. Apart from all of this, he noticed that these occult leaders also practice cannibalism. After escaping the situation, before either being sacrificed or forced into the group, Ilion made his way back to Germany, where he published his experience in 1937. It would be Ilion's story and all of the other tales before his that would lead to the Nazi fascination with Tibet and an ancient superior race. Felix Neidner founded the Thule Society in 1910. In 1918, Rudolf Freier von Sabotendorf established its Munich branch. Dietrich Eckhart, a member of the inner circle of the Thule Society, initiated Hitler into the society and taught him how to interact with ancient Aryan spirits through meditation. Hitler's admiration with mysticism started in his youth when he had studied the occult and theosophy in Vienna. Later, Hitler dedicated Mein Kampf to Eckhart. When Eckhart died in December 1923, he is reported to have said, follow Hitler, he will dance but it is I who have called the tune. I have initiated him into the secret doctrine, opened his centers in vision, and given him the means to communicate with the powers. Do not mourn for me. I shall have influenced history more than any other German. The Thule Society was a German occultist group and a major supporter of the Nazi party, named after a mythical land belonging to the Atlantean mythology. It was this occult group that would proliferate the belief in a German ancestry linked to the so-called Aryan race which once ruled over Atlantis and would be destined to regain its powers. Leader of the SS, Heinrich Himmler, furthered the Nazis' belief in mysticism with the formation of the Annenerb, a sort of historical research society with a mission to find evidence for their claims. In 1938, Himmler sent a team of Nazis to Tibet in search of origins for the lost Aryan race who were Indo-European descendants of the mythical Atlantean race of Thule. The Nazis took advantage of Asian symbols and language, using them for their own means. The term Aryan comes from the Sanskrit word Arya, meaning noble. The word comes from the Vedas, the most ancient Hindu scriptures which detail a race of light-skinned people from Central Asia who overtook the darker-skinned or Dravidian people of the Indian subcontinent. There is evidence for these claims within the Indo-European migration which resulted in several ethnic groups splitting from a single source, moving into much of India and Europe at some point between 2000 and 1500 BCE. And of course, there was the obvious rendering of the Sanskrit svastika transformed into the Nazi swastika. Hitler and his team of occultists believed that the ancient Aryan race went into hiding in Agartha, a mythical inner earth kingdom similar to Shambhala, which the Nazis believed could be found in the Himalayan mountain range.
American researcher and occultist Maurice Doriel founded the Brotherhood of the White Temple in Colorado in 1930. He had a massive personal library on occult and esoteric subjects. He is probably most famous for publishing the incalculably influential Emerald Tablets of Toth the Atlantean in 1939. It's an esoteric classic that has endlessly influenced the esoteric community since its inception. Doriel claimed to have spent eight years in Tibet, where he was initiated into the secrets of a mysterious group of ascended masters. It was through them that he was given the task to translate the tablets of this ancient Atlantean deity. The tablets speak of Atlantis being overran by evil shape-shifting spiritual entities who infiltrated the minds of the leaders, causing its demise. Doriel also claimed to be in contact with the ascended masters of Tibet through astral projection, where they would show him a fantastic place with an astounding library that held all the world's occult knowledge. Many things have been said about Shambhala, mostly that it is a jeweled city of spiritual magnitude that can only be found by a righteous journey through the forbidden valleys within the Himalayan mountain range. The actual origins of the myth come from the quasi-magical religious teachings in what is known as the Kalachakra Tantra, Wheel of Time. It teaches the reader a brief practice in achieving enlightenment within years rather than lifetimes. The book was introduced to the Buddhist monastic center of Nalanda from India in 966 CE and later into Tibet in 1026 CE by a mysterious figure known as Silupa. There are various accounts of Silupa's travel, but all generally agree that this spiritual leader came forth from Shambhala, bringing the doctrine of higher learning towards ascension within the Kala Chakra text. Legendary guru and tantric master Padma Sambhava, in his Guide to the Hidden Land of the Valley of Artemisia, translated by Giacomella Orofino in 1997, relates a prophecy about Shambhala from the Kala Chakra. The prophecy is paraphrased as follows. When the world is coming to a chaotic state and the enemies of evil begin to breach into Tibet, the Tibetans must renounce everything. When Mount Kailash is destroyed, that will be the sign to open the spiritual door to Shambhala and escape. The Kala Chakra foretold of an apocalyptic war that would cause the destruction of Tibet and the forcing of its spiritual people to open the doors to Shambhala, where also a Messiah King would come forth to destroy the earthly enemies before closing its doors one last time. Shambhala was seen then as an etherical kingdom existing in a parallel dimension hidden from ours. The Bon believed that only those with pure hearts can truly find it among the labyrinth of mountains and valleys of Tibet. 